There we go. One thing about New Orleans, in 1804, they were informed they're now part of the United States. Good wait. 1804. Yeah, January 1st, New Orleans was informed you're now part of the United States. Actually, it was a really interesting day for New Orleans. At 8 o'clock in the morning, on January 1st, 1804, they were told they're no longer Spanish territory. You, they, you've been claimed by a secret treaty with France in 1801. So that morning, 8 o'clock, the French flag went down in what is now Jackson Square. Or the Spanish flag went down, the French flag went up. And they beat the drum, boom. Noon, someone came out and read a proclamation that you are now part of the United States. They wrote the drum, the French flag went up, the U.S. flag went down. So in three days, the U.S. flag went up. In three days, New Orleans was in three countries, part of three countries. Did I say three days? One day. Actually, about four hours. New Orleans was in three countries. So, with that, we're not going to talk a lot about Lewis and Clark. If you're more interested in this, we do teach a History of the American West class. I don't know who will teach it next year, this year. Uh, Ms. Pierce down the hall is for sure teaching here. She teaches that, but there's going to be some changes because, I don't know, but but she might teach it again. But that goes through all the American West. And West. Yeah. Um, no, it's been here before. It's hmm? it's yes. And Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter used to teach it for years, and now she teaches it. And there will be some change up because I have four AP US history classes, and the odds are I won't have that again. So I I don't know if I'll teach that, but I might teach on my graduates. We might boss people around. Well, I'll let you know when I find out. So when they went, the plan was that they would leave in 1804 and they would go up the Missouri River. They knew the latitude of this a village right here of Mandans, which is present-day Bismarck, and they knew the mouth of the Columbia River was on the same latitude. So what they thought they would do is they get up here and then go into the unknown here. They thought it would take one year. In fact, what they thought was they would get here sometime in, let's say, September 1804, and a trading vessel, because there were a lot of trading vessels would come through, they'd hop on board that, because I know this sounds weird, but it was a heck of a lot faster to go then all the way around South America and go back up here, then walk across again. So that's what the plan was. Things did not go by the plan at all. They had four main goals of the core discovery. And we're going to get these kind of things on a series of discoveries. We'll mention one more in class. There's another one, uh, William, or, um, John Fremont, a little bit down the road. But four main goals when they went. First one, when they went through, they were going to get a land plan. They wanted a better claim. France claimed this land by just simply when Champlain got to the mouth of the Missouri, when the Missouri ran into the Mississippi, Champlain just said, I claim all of this for France. So we walked through it. The United States has a better land claim. But remember, I'm saying the word claim. The U.S. still has got to conquer it to actually get control for the people who live there. And they're not going to be asked. So this is, you know, oh, we got the land yet. No, this is... A conquest, and it's going to be, um, and the subjugate to people who lived here, which is not anything that you Americans are proud of talking about. That's one. Get the land claim, but that, but especially Oregon, Oregon, U.S., Britain, France, and Spain. Let's say France, U.S., Britain, Russia, and Spain all claimed Oregon. So get a claim to Oregon. We'll come back to that claim a little bit later. So the big one we care about is Britain, actually. Two, uh, get trade relations with the various tribes. And the idea was as they go through and get trade, especially fur trade. The fur trade was the big, the beaver trade was becoming an incredibly important trade for this era. And they wanted to move into here and <coughs> control this trade before British, especially British fur trading companies and Spanish ones. Three, ports. They wanted good ports with a lucrative China trade. The trade with China was exploding because the East India Company in India, remember them, the one who did the tea, the tea Act, they have discovered a way to tap into the Chinese market. Opium, oh, yeah. yep. And the U.S. wanted to get, U.S. merchants wanted to get involved in that. So Jefferson wanted port cities. 
and they knew we got to claim along this coast there was some great natural harbors. And four, this was a scientific mission too. All the men were supposed to take journals, they were supposed to record what they see, take samples, and send back if they could samples. So, when it turned out to be much more difficult to pull keel boats up the Missouri River, those guys, I, I still just can't get over the idea that, hey, we're going to walk to the Columbia. <laughs> they were of a different breed back then. But while we're doing that, we're going to pull 20 foot long keel boats up the Missouri River. Count me in! Tough, tough. But as they went, they only got here by November of 1804 and spent a lovely winter in North Dakota. <laughs> Who spent a winter in North Dakota? Oh, it's beautiful. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> huh? So what you're saying is North Dakota is awesome, but you don't want these people to come and spoil it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. The best part is, nothing stops the wind from Hudson Bay. <laughs> nothing. So you, get really, you just can feel the chill. And then to make up for it, the summer's hot and mosquitoes the size of small butts. <laughs> so they got there and he sent a, they sent a bunch of animals and you know towels or skins back. The big thing was they sent a prairie dog back and they all live in the White House and Jefferson. Like, oh, <laughs> and the prairie dog's still there. You can pet him. Like George. And uh, you see all these political cartoons up to about 1840. And they would put prairie dogs in the cartoon, but I just think it's so funny because it was it, it, seen as such an exotic animal, which kind of makes me laugh. And all the prairie dogs in these cartoons, I, I'll show you when we get to the Texas annexation in the 1840s. I know, because we're drawing about this prairie dog. It's human size. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been great if there were actually human sized prairie dogs roaming the plains? <laughs> and. What's that? Is that? Well, they also map. This is a copy uh, from their journal showing them a very accurate map, even the kind of guess of the mountains here. And they really, it was a meticulous journey. And they thought of a number of things. The Industrial Revolution had just begun in, in Britain. And as they dug mines for coal or also dug canals, they were discovering incredible things. They'd seen it before, but never the widespread digging until the Industrial Revolution. What were they finding? They just blew them away. Yeah, fossils. And I can't even begin to tell you what a big deal this was. And you need you know, a lot of mining to see them. You see them occasionally, but so many. And all these fossils. First off, this was a crisis of confidence that shook people to their very core. What do you mean? There's animals that don't exist anymore? God made a mistake. That just blew them away. This was a big deal. A whole scientific genre come out of the Industrial Revolution and finding these fossils. It's just incredible. But not only that, they assume, well, God, these animals have to be somewhere. So they started finding dinosaur bones, they assumed, well, they gotta be here. So they thought they might find mammals and dinosaurs, and once again, darn it. And then my favorite thing is they thought they might find bandy legged, short, muscular Welshmen. <laughs> Welshmen from Wales. They're awesome castles and everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, when they started seeing various ruins of, of uh, American Indian civilizations where the people had all died and they saw these ruins, there was kind of this rumor that they were somehow Welsh. And I've always wondered why Welsh? Probably I mean, the, um, the architecture, isn't it? You know, that, you could say that, but the, the English built the castles. So. Well, anyways, I just, I am so disappointed they did not find these short, bandy ladies, bearded. I forgot bearded. I assume only the men, but you never know. <laughs> well, well. And this was a very successful scientific mission. Yeah. The big one you didn't know is the British also claimed it. That's the big one. Russia and Spain did too, but eventually it's going to come to Britain and the U.S. And, and so they went. And actually, the Spanish tried to stop them two times. They sent military expeditions to find them and kill them. Two times. And they missed them. One time by just a day. And it would have been one of those things if they would have caught them, 
there would have been, and yes, there was an attempt of exploration that disappeared. It, just, it would have been gone. It's one of those another like, wow, what if? Well, it took them a year, took them another year to go here. They also assumed that very symmetrical, these are very logical people. And if you have a plain, low mountains, plain, they assumed it would be low mountains, plain. So they thought it would be just then boop, and then right over. In fact, what they thought was this scientific mission that they'd finally find the Northwest Passage. That would be the Northwest Passage, an all-water route where they could take a water all the way to the end of the Missouri River, and then they assumed it would just be like, okay, just a quick hunt, jump over the mountains, and then we're off the Columbia, or off down the Columbia, boom, right to the ocean. And boy, were they shocked when they got to the continent of the Bay and expecting to see the Columbia, and what did they see? More and more and more mountains. Yeah, it was a. It turned out things aren't quite as symmetrical the way they thought. It seemed very logical, and they would never have made it without the help of American Indians. Never would have made it, especially the Shoshone and the Nez Perce. And looking back at it, you'd want to tell the Shoshone and the Nez Perce, "Don't help. This will not help you. You will be punished." They were for helping down the road. It's one of these. They probably had the idea that they'd get better treatment. No, it just, I think it was more, it was more anything else, hospitality. And some trade stuff, but. And so, with that, it took them one year to get all the way back. And while that's going on, that wasn't the only mission. There were other big expeditions. The other really big one was Zebulon Pike, who went here. And Pike's mission is one of the greatest stories in history. But no one really talks about it because the core discovery captured everybody's mind. I mean, Zebulon, okay, first off, let's be clear about Zebulon. Once again, if you have children, <laughs> right? Great name. Think about it. Zebulon. And if you have two children, Zebulon one, Zebulon yeah. two. How do you spell it? T H A T. Children. And. <laughs> O-L-A-S. Zebulon. <laughs> right? Isn't that a great name? Come here, little Zebulon. Come here, little Chipotlebeck. Oh, okay, we're not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> huh? <laughs> His parents were the same. That's just a really common name. Zebulon is actually a really common name. But now it's not. <laughs> and so we can bring it back. <laughs> actually, that'd be a good name for a cat or a dog, wouldn't it? <laughs> Would that, that, that'd be a great pet's name. All right, for a guinea pig, <laughs> good eat. All right, so they actually discovered Pike's Peak. I mean, their story was they were going to explore here. They got caught by the Mexicans near Santa Fe, or the Spanish by Santa Fe, brought into Span New Spain, which is Mexico. They escaped and walked all the way back across the desert to Louisiana. I mean, there's an incredible story that took two and a half years, and nobody remembers Fort Zebulon Pike except for they got a mountain named after him. And so with that, Zebulon's Peak, Pike's Peak in Colorado. This wasn't the only part of the exploration, but that's, you look at these couple of events and it gave Jefferson <coughs> administration the fuel of success, the aura of success. <coughs> and so in 1804, while the Louisiana Purchase just happened, Lewis and Clark are gone, Zebulon Pike and other missions are ready to take off. We have land policy that's opening up land. Jefferson's administration was seen as a great success. Many Federalists had decided he did not destroy the country. We're still here. And so in 1804, in 1804, Jefferson is going to be overwhelmingly reelected. If you look at this, only a couple states voted for the Federalists. But I should very quickly mention the duel. Burr and Hamilton did fight a duel. Do we know about this duel? <laughs> we saw the video. <laughs> Duels are fought all the time, and or at least challenged all the time. And political discourse was so new that people didn't know how to handle when somebody criticized them. And a lot of times they saw, like, "You disagree with me? You, you've." Uh, um, attack my honor, prepare to defend yourself. So there are all these duels fought over things that nowadays we just get on television and, and yabber. That's yabber. 
I honestly just think it. I, dueling would be much more interesting. No, dueling is bad. That's insane. I'm saying that because people are listening. But what happened was this. First off, remember the election of 1801 with the House of Representatives, Hamilton kept Burr, or at least Burr thought he kept him from being elected. Hamilton also worked very hard to make sure Burr wasn't elected governor of New York. And all through 1803, they had a letter writing campaign, and they bitterly attacked each other. And with this, finally the last straw was Hamilton wrote in the newspaper, a friendly newspaper, that Burr is a man who does not know the truth, meaning he's a liar. Burr, whose reputation was a scoundrel by then, and he was trying to kind of, I don't know, to bring back his honor, challenge him to a duel. Hamilton, who by then was kind of a pariah, the Federalist by then didn't like him anymore, isn't that interesting, the guy who was kind of the ideological founder of the party, they wanted nothing to do with him. And he was in kind of an exile in New York. He thought, I must have been. And whoever's challenged gets to pick the weapon. And I know what you're thinking. Spoons? <laughs> uh, maybe, oh, I don't know one. Beats. People beat at each other. <laughs> no, they should use swords and like use the edge and rightly techniques. Unscrew the palm of the other It's a good idea. You should have won. Hamilton had specially designed dueling pistols. These pistols had a rifle barrel and they're accurate up to 50 yards. Now, pistols are always inaccurate, but pistols back then were basically, you couldn't hit anything, you were already hit the ground. And so 50 yards was really accurate for a weapon then. And they also had a hair trigger. You know what hair trigger means? Bang! It's going to fire right to squeeze almost no pressure on it. These are flintlock muskets, but still a pistol. He had these, so he had been challenged to a duel before. He had these specially made. So we're going to use my pistols. Now, a lot of times, the duels would end just like this. They would come to the appointed area. So usually men, both men would come and say, I'm here to defend my honor, so am I. Well, we agreed we're not cowards, we defended our honor, yes. And they would go home. Because most people are not psychopaths and want to shoot each other. So they just wanted to defend their honor. Well, when Hamilton and, and Burr went to where they're going to do, do the duel, they had this, all these rules to make sure that no one is going to be arrested. Bringing a gun to a place with the purpose of killing somebody is first degree murder. <laughs> <laughs> and so they have all these things. In fact, they went to an island in the Hudson River that it wasn't clear if it was in New Jersey or New York. To get why? In fact, a lot of duels were fought there. Now, they were both rowed out to this island, and the men were told, stay in the boat. You don't know what's going on. I said, we have no idea. Everybody knew, but they had to stay in the boat so they could have deniability. And then when they went there, you kind of see it here. Okay, I love this picture for lots of reasons. But this one, I love how Burr holds the pistol, kind of like. <laughs> well, anyways, they each had a second. And their second would be a, a close friend. And let's say, here's Burr. So Burr's right there on his second. He'd stand off to the side. He couldn't see Burr and just be watching Hamilton like this. With the idea being... And this is what happened. Burr shot Hamilton. His second could say, I don't know what happened. I don't know what Burr was doing, but Hamilton had a gun. So it's self implying self-defense. In a murder trial or any trial, you don't have to prove your innocence. You just have to give a reason for the, tr the jury to acquit you. That's all you need. It's not proving your innocence. It's getting that acquittal. And so... They both had a second, and there was a man in the middle. This one, they dropped a handkerchief. Sometimes they go one, two, three. Here, yeah, he's just going like this. I don't know where he's going to touch him or surrender him. But. <laughs> and his idea is, I'm looking forward. I don't know, I just dropped my handkerchief, and these guys shot a shooter. You know, the whole thing was deniability. And you ever seen that in movies, you know, they stand back to back, you know, you ever seen those? No, they did not do that. They marked off 20 paces, and they stood there like this. I'm looking at each other. They had to wear, they were supposed to wear no cloaks or coat. So they couldn't shield or hide their body from the person shooting at them. That would be unsportsmanlike. <laughs> and, but they could stand sideways and not like, you know, shoot me! <laughs> go like this. Another very common thing to do if they wouldn't just go home would be to shoot in the air or shoot in the ground. You know, once again, I've preserved honor. I've defended myself. You defended yourself. We can go home now. Honor has been, honor has been preserved. Well, 
Hamilton. They dropped the handkerchief and they both stared at each other for a while. Yeah, you know, that's who's going to move first. Hamilton started going like this, and right about here, the gun went off. Now, we're not sure if it was the hair trigger or he was shooting in the air. But Burr said he could hear the whistle of the bullet go by. Now, these are it's three high explosives. This is black powder. The musket will also move very fast. And when it's rifled and spin, you can hear it spin in the air. Kind of a, whir a whirring sound, like a, like a whistle. And the thing is, that had to be just a, a pleasant sound going right by your ear. Well, Burr, over here, grit his teeth, took careful aim, and I always wonder what Hamilton felt at that moment. I think he's going like, the hell with on. No. <laughs> and Burr hit him right. Ripped apart his ribs, collapsed his lung, which I guess the pain is, I, I've heard the collapsed lung described as exquisite. <laughs> Has anyone had a, anyone had a broken rib? Felt, felt good, didn't it? Every breath is like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> yeah, not broken a rib, it's awful. <laughs> Volunteers? No, don't get your rib broken. But a collapse line, I guess, is unreal. But he didn't die right away. He, he lived a day. In and out. They did the they poked to try to find the bullet. I mean, it just just torturing the poor man. We're now never sure what happened. Burr, as you can imagine, is going to be a scoundrel after this. He already had kind of has the reputation of being a scoundrel. And the next year, he's going to join General James Wilkinson as a plan to, to secede much of the West and create his own country called the Burr Conspiracy. Burr's on the left. That's a picture of him later on in life. And boy, does he look just sinister in that one. Doesn't he? Just like I love how symmetrical his face looks. It's terrible. I know his angle, but it actually. I like that. Was that who? It kind of does. That's it. I never thought that. Just paint him green. He now this is treason. They, they would talk of a trial. There would be a trial, but he would not be. He would be more anything else. A hung jury. They just let it go. It's really embarrassing to have the vice president do all of these things. The former vice president, and so that would be the end of Burr. Even though Burr's got this horrific reputation, but it also confirmed the fears that everybody had that that part of the country would break away. Okay, right here. One more thing happened in Jefferson's second term we have to get to before all hell broke loose. 1808, the United States banned the slave trade. Remember the compromise in the Constitution that said they couldn't sl touch the slave trade for 20 years? In 20 years, Jefferson signed the bill. Now, this picture is from, a, from an anti-slavery journal, and it's trying to show the hells of the slave trade of the transatlantic slave trade, which was horrific beyond our any comprehension we have. But this was an ultra-tight packer. And what they would do is, they would push everybody in, sitting like this, and squeeze their legs in, and then chain them down like that. And that's how they cross the Atlantic. Ugh. I mean, this is torture beyond anybody's comprehension. The whole idea is, yeah, a lot are going to die in this really long trip, and so we're going to get as many people as possible to make a problem. And in a way, Jefferson's saying, we are now banning this trade so the United States no longer has this trade to worry about, so our slaves are treated much better than that. But what Jefferson is thinking is this. You stop this horrific trade, eventually, slavery can go away. The number of slaves will drop as the rest of the country goes, um, gets bigger. And he was thinking, how do your slavery be gone? If we die a natural death, we won't need a war or a rebellion and just go away. Now you'll notice something, it also tells you a lot about Jefferson, the complexities of this man. Who else will be gone in a hundred years? We'll have to worry about having this issue. Huh? Yeah, Jefferson will be dead. So he won't have to worry about giving up his slaves and his cookie lifestyle. We'll leave it to the next generations. Nobody today pushes problems off to the future. It's basically that like sort of whole sort of like, oh, someone else will do it. Exactly. Down the road. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I think now of, of uh, either fossil fuels or climate change or something like that. The hell trade of that. But even though this happened, they could still trade slaves. 
just not people they kidnapped in Africa. And yes, people would find a gray area there, right? Yeah, I think you'd probably guess what that gray area is. Hey, we only got on board. Yeah. Commercial war. Well, that war between England and France, it's still going on. And there's stalemate there. And both sides turn to warfare to try to destroy the other's economy, <coughs> their trade. Because they couldn't beat each other, they couldn't defeat each other uh, on land or sea. Britain, this is the uh, shot from the Battle of Trafalgar, Britain controlled the seas. They knocked out the Sp combined French-Spanish fleet. They controlled the seas. France controlled almost all of Europe, defeating enemy after enemy. That is the Napoleon's perhaps greatest victory, Austerlitz, over the Russians and the Austrians. And so Napoleon controlled most of Europe, but Britain controlled the seas. Stalemate. Now, the United States, their merchants are trading with both countries, more with Britain than other countries, but American merchants are trading with both. Well, Britain and France want to stop that trade to hurt their enemy, and the U.S. is going to get involved. U.S. claims to be, remember, neutral. Now, both are going to try to restrict the trade. The French will act first in what's called the Berlin and Milan Decrees. They create what they call the Continental System. Napoleon did this in Berlin and Milan, and it gives you an idea how powerful France was. Milan is here, present-day Italy, and Berlin's in Prussia, which is present-day Germany. So Napoleon controlled all the areas in blue, and then France here too. I don't know why that's not blue. They will not trade with Britain. No trade with Britain in any of those areas. Basically, what they're trying to do is embargo Britain, drive them out. But not just trade with Britain. They will also not trade with any ship that's ever traded with Britain. So they go and find a ship and it's manifest. They're recording of the, what the, where they've been, that you went to Portsmouth, England. You won't be allowed to trade anywhere in Europe. Now, it didn't work that this is going to affect American shipping. Britain responded with the Orders in Council. The Orders in Council involved Elvis. Hmm? Mm -hmm. He was quite a lot. Yes. France and Britain want to stop trading with each other, but the U.S. is going to get caught in the middle because the U.S. wants to trade with both. The British responded with the Orders in Council, which meant that Orders in Council they got a loose or a, the, the way they wrote the law, which meant a blockade of Europe. And this is a ship on lonely blockade usually. And I can't begin to tell you how awful the life was for the sailors on the board these ships. I mean, the Royal Navy sailors were at a 20 year hitch. They might be at sea for two years and never touch land. And so supplies would come out there. Discipline was incredibly harsh. The cat and nine tails, remember that? Ugh. For the most minor offense, the food was horrific. Scurvy ravaged the crew. You know what scurvy is? A deficiency of vitamin C. And basically think about the most horrific skin disease, boils, eventually your teeth would fall out, your joints would begin to eat away, your eyes would begin to eat away. Scurvy is horrific. It's mostly a lack of vitamin C. You ever heard people from Britain called limeys? That's because limes or lime juice were given to sailors to stop scurvy. That's the term lime, because it's such a seafaring country. But not only that, how did somebody get into the Royal Navy? <laughs> they pressed them into the crew. It's called the press games. And they would send guys out, and I just thought this picture was kind of funny, but this is a picture of a press game. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they would send these guys out and to various like, poor parts of London, and that's recruiting. <laughs> Bonk them on the head, they'd wake up on board a ship, and you're in the Royal Navy for 20 years. <laughs> you, you complain... <clears throat> 100 lashes with a cat and nine tails. Anybody else want to complain? And you did not sign papers. All I had to do, all you had to do to join the Navy is take money from the king or queen. It was called taking the king's showing. And I just thought this painting was funny. It's actually how the army, but the Navy did the same thing. And what they would do is if you took a showing of money, a gold coin, once you took it, you're in for 20 years. So what they would do is they go re recruiting in bars. 
Here is a young recruit right behind the next sign. Now, that's the problem. Next signs would get in the way in previous and all this stuff. I love this guy's look. I just think this painting's funny. Uh, and they would feed him beer or other drinks, distract him because that would be a prostitute. And then as they gave him beer, for example, all of a sudden they kind of go, boop, drop a coin in. Here, take this. And, go, boop, and now you're in. And that's his job. To walk up, bang, and you'd wake up. So what do you suppose what members of the Royal Navy did every chance they could? Yeah, they deserted. And so that would be a real issue for the Royal Navy. How do you keep sailors in? Because it was so awful. So they did impress them. When they would stop American merchant ships, they would impress American sailors. They go on board and say, you men are deserters. And now you're in the Royal Navy. How do you know what a deserter looks like? Yeah. They didn't care. And I did this in the wrong order. I don't know how I got out of order. But they would line them up. And they just would pick out like five or six. If they need five sailors, the five healthiest looking sailors, you guys are deserters. And they drag them in. They just, And then they would drag them in. Beat the tar out of them. And now they're in the Royal Navy again for 20 years. Maybe they were deserters. Maybe they weren't. Who cares? Well, think about what this did to American merchant sailors. Who'd want to be a sailor if you might get thrown into the Royal Navy? So American merchant ships are really being hurt. It's difficult to trade. The blockade is cutting them off, and now they can't find sailors. They demand Jefferson to act, and Jefferson decides, okay, last thing for today, we will trade with nobody. We will show you, and it's called the embargo. We'll finish this. we got a little bit left to finish on Monday. We get to most of the war. Then we have a test. I don't know what the what you guys are going to do after the PSAT on Wednesday. I really don't know what the schedule is. But is it till noon? So all of you are taking it. You know, there'll be an assignment. Okay, that's why. And for those of you who are going to be here, we get all during the war. But we got to have an assignment. Hey, it'd be easier for me if I didn't have to get this time. Do you believe me? I could have proof. Can I do it for you? Because I care, people. I care.